You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom, Havarim Shalom. That means peace to you, our friends in Hebrew. This is Keith Johnson with Nehemia Gordon, ready to take another peek into the prophets to not only see, but we are sure we're going to find some pearls to share with you. I normally say, Shalom, Chaver, Shili, Atah, Mohan, are you ready? But I know he's ready because he's got his little cup of coffee. And he's converted me, folks. I'm actually sitting here with... Wait, the, Keith no, has been converted? I'm not drinking, co- I'm not drinking coffee. I actually have uh, this chai tea. It's warm and oh, I got good. it and you've got your coffee. I've got my tea. So I will ask you, uh, Atah, Mohan, are you ready? Ani Mohan, Keith. I am ready. Um, and, and actually, I have a confession to make. So I am drinking... I'm not drinking Nescafe anymore. Now I'm drinking uh, Folgers decaf out of a Starbucks mug that says on it. <laughs> Changsha. Changsha, the city in China where I live for a year. Yeah. And we are hoping that Folgers will send uh, something to NehemiasWall.com, BFAInternational.com for that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> may it be. May it be. Oh, man. Hey, we're going to get started, Nehemia. We're actually in the book of Amos, and I've been looking forward to this for a while um, because I love any time we do a section where I can actually say I've been to the place. And mm. we, we talk a lot about yeah. this, but Amos being in, from Tekoa, which is, I don't know, 12, 13 miles from Jerusalem. Well, it's a lot less uh, than that. Yeah, I mean... I think it's kilometers. Yeah, 12 <laughs> or 13 kilometers, actually, you're right. So, uh, but what's interesting about it is, you, you know, we're, we, we normally go right to the section. Folks are, are reading the, the to- listening to Torah Pearls, which is the, the section in the Torah. We did the original Torah Pearls program and the Prophet section, which is connection, connected and as much as I would like to be able to say we can go through the entire book of Amos because we could do seriously a series on this book and it yeah, would take us, sure. you know, we could we could do a well, chat. I, I could spend the whole time just in one verse. Absolutely. <laughs> we could. But uh, what's interesting about it is a little context, if I can, having been there. And, and when yeah. you open up Amos and you just look at the first verse, you hear about Amos, who was a shepherd. And the reason I want to start with this, because I think it's really kind of related. Yeah. It says in Amos uh, chapter one, folks, we're going to be going to Amos chapter two, verse six. But to just start out a little bit in this first verse, it says the words of Amos, Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake. And then it goes on to say the textual time. So it actually gives us Mm -hmm. the context of when he was prophesying, where he was prophesying. And not only that, the life circumstance he was in. He, it says, was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. and, And now here's the thing that's, you know, people can go back and forth. But I think what's amazing about it is that God can choose whoever he wants, whenever he wants, uh, to give them, to have the ability for them to see and to hear and for him to speak through him. And I, I just think it's really interesting, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, that the person that's that's prophesying, is it's clearly saying that he was a shepherd. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and not only, with, you know, part of the point of him being a shepherd is that he's not a professional prophet, and that mm-hmm. comes up later in chapter 7. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, first of all, let's just uh, give some more perspective. So, um, you know, Israel's not that big of a country. I remember I used to sit in my classes at, at Mount Scopus at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which is in the northeastern corner of modern-day Jerusalem, and I could look out my window in one direction of the classroom, and I would see a Herodian, mm-hmm. which was this palace, a summer palace built by Herod, and um, uh, in, in, that palace is right next to Tekoa, mm-hmm. meaning when you're saying Herodian, you're essentially saying Tekoa, where, where, um, where Amos was from. And then the other direction, I could look out and I could see King Hussein's palace. Mm-hmm. He was a king of Jordan who built the palace there in, in, uh, just before the Six Day War and, and never finished it, so it was left as a skeleton. And that is the biblical site of Gibeah, where mm-hmm. Saul was from. So mm-hmm. imagine, so Saul is in Benjamin, mm-hmm. and I can see that in one direction. The other direction, I can look and I can see um, what is the heart of Judea, mm-hmm. or the heart of the tribe of mm-hmm. Judah, which is Tekoa. And I look out in, in a third direction and I can see Transjordan, mm-hmm. which is the area of the tribe of Gad, of God. Um, you know, in today the kingdom of Jordan. So, I, I mean, it's really kind of like you you get in that a strategic location like that, like Mount Scopus, and you can really see the geography and really appreciate it. Mm. And here's the interesting thing. He was from the south. He was a southerner. Mm-hmm. He was a southern boy. Mm-hmm. But he went and he uh, he was the opposite of the prophet we spoke about last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hosea, who was a northern prophet and mainly prophesied to the north. Um Amos prophesied to the north, as, uh, was from the south, but also prophesied to the north. Mm-hmm. And that's what comes out in Amos chapter 7. There's this encounter with this false prophet named Amaziah, mm-hmm. uh, Amaziah. Uh, and 
and, and his name means uh, Yah strengthens me, uh, uh, or Yah makes Yehovah makes me uh, brave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he was a false prophet in the name of Yehovah. And and, and it's uh, verse twelve. Uh, and Amaziah said to Amos, uh, "Seer, go and flee you to the land of Judah and eat there and prophesy there. But don't come any more to prophesy in Bethel." Now, mm-hmm. why Bethel? Bethel was at the southern end of the kingdom of Israel. Remember, there's two kingdoms: ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. And the southern end of the of the kingdom, the main sanctuary in the south of the northern kingdom, was mm-hmm. uh, Bethel. And he's saying, "Look, don't go and go and prophesy in your kingdom. We don't need you here, you mm-hmm. foreigner. Mm-hmm. Get out of here." Um, and Amos answered and said to Amaziah, "I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I am a cowherder and a gatherer of sycamores." I love that verse; one of the greatest <laughs> verses in, in yeah, the Bible. Cool. And what his point is, I, I didn't come here to eat. Yeah, I came here to speak the word of God. Amen, amen. And so that's who we, that's who we're talking about. And you know, there's so many, so many wonderful verses that we could that we could spend our time with. But we are we're mm-hmm. limited by both time and and context. That the prophet pearl section starts in Amos chapter two verse six. But mm-hmm. there's no way that we can actually do what we're doing without making some re- reference back and forth throughout yeah. the book. I mean, that's always going to be the case. So let me go ahead and start reading, if it's okay, in 2 verse 6. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm reading from the uh, NASB right now. I sometimes use the NIV, sometimes the NASB. Sometimes I look at my Hebrew. I actually have my Hebrew Bible, my NIV, the NASB. And look, Nehemiah is not the only one with a computer right now, but he's the fastest tapper in all of <laughs> the kingdom of computer tapping. He's amazing how fast he can find stuff. Now, so, now you said I converted you, but you didn't tell the people the truth about how I lost you. you what, you've gone over to Macintosh. <laughs> <laughs> that is another discussion, folks. I have had a computer crisis. In fact, it's taken a long time to be able to even get to this place. Uh, it, well, let, let's get into the Bible study, yeah. if we can. Thus saith the Lord, or um, Yahovah. For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. It's a, uh, an italicized word here, Nehemiah. And then it says, why? Because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. When I looked at the, the phrase, the thing that hit me right away was just to ask the question, where do we see that phrase? And it's interesting. You can go um, Which and phrase? The, 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 for three for three transgressions in, are, oh. of Israel and for four. Yeah. One of the things that um, hit me, if I can just share this very, very quickly, is that there's if if we look ahead of time there's this um there's this 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 phrase that he keeps using for three transgressions and for four and then he does this and this is actually in starting in one verse two it, he first he hits with damascus then he hits with gaza then tyre edom edom ammon moab and then by the time we get to chapter two verse six it kind of switches so i want to give context before you comment on this mm-hmm. so he's talking to these people so how does he get their attention First, he says, hey, for those people in Damascus and those people in this place and for those people in that place. So they're like, yeah, for those people. Yes, that's just what's going to happen. Yes, that's what's going to happen. And then he says, now for Israel. <laughs> right. And, and, and really what it is, it's human psychology. It's so much easier to see somebody else's problems. Exactly. And so first he gives a long list of this is what these people did and what those people. Exactly. And the Israelites hearing him are like, yeah, those yeah, right. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, us? Uh-oh. Yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And so that's what, and that's what we're getting to. And so but what I, what I liked, and I just want to share this very quickly, yeah. and then you can comment. Um, sure. I was just looking at this, the, the idea of the phrase. And so when I looked at the phrase for the, for three, it says, I'm sorry, it's verse number six. Um, just a really quick thing in Proverbs, I think, it, yes, Proverbs 30, verse 15, it says, the leech has two daughters. Give, give. There are three things that will not be satisfied, four that will not say enough. And then Proverbs 30, 21, under three things, the earthquakes <clears throat> under four cannot bear up. And if you remember a couple times ago, we mm-hmm. were talking about this sort of um, yeah, th- th- this so, this so, actual. So we actually in, in the story of um, of uh, you know Solomon and and Adoniahu that you know Adoniahu was the third son and then Solomon was the fourth son. So this is this is a way of Hebrew thinking. It's called the graduated numbers in mm-hmm. Hebrew. We call it mispal medulag, mm-hmm. and it's it's often three four, but it also can be one two six seven, six, seven. a thousand ten thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just give you an example of one two, which if you don't know. People come up with all kinds of bizarre interpretations because they don't they don't understand this Hebrew way of thinking. It said uh, this is in Psalm chapter sixty two, verse um, verse eleven in the English twelve in the Hebrew. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this that power belongs to God. Mm-hmm. And people come along and they say, wait a minute, did he speak once or twice? Mm-hmm. So they'll say he spoke once, but he had two different meanings. No, <laughs> this is the this is the graduated mm-hmm. numbers. It simply mm-hmm. is the Hebrew way of expressing two mm-hmm. in a sort of poetic way. 
Um, and again, Job thirty three fourteen. For God may speak in one way or in an, uh, in another. It says in English, yet man does not perceive it. Uh, in Hebrew, it says God speaks in, in uh, one way, and in two, it is he uh, he does not perceive it. Mm-hmm. Man does not perceive mm-hmm. it. So there, it's really two. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's this is this is throughout Hebrew literature this kind of structure. And one of the really famous ones that people get so confused by. And they come up with all kinds of bizarre theories is in Deuteronomy 16. I'm sure we talked about it in the original Torah pearls, but I'll just re- reiterate it here real quick. Um, it's talking about uh, about um, about Chag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened mm-hmm. Bread, which we know from uh, a whole bunch of other passages is seven days. <laughs> and then here in 16, Deuteronomy 16, it says, Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a sacred assembly to Jehovah your God. And so some people have come along and said, Oh, you only eat unleavened bread for six days, and the seventh is... Un- is, is this you know feast and but what's going on here? It's seven in other places. This is just the Hebrew way of expressing seven. Mm. It's the graduated number mm-hmm. six and seven, three and four. Two. So if if you ask how many of these um, sins does Israel have, the answer is four. Mm-hmm. And that's actually what we see. And you, when you go through the when we go through the section again, those that are are interested, I hope that you'll uh, look at context for Amos, Amos, and you'll you'll read those. But when we get to this one, the first one that comes up, and and, and check me on this. So the first one that comes up, it says. What is the four things? It first says, because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now, when I read that verse, I'm thinking there's there's got to be something to this that's not just here with, with Amos. You, 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 for example, and I, I bring this mm-hmm. as context. Nehemiah, I, I taunt you about this all the time. Yeah. How many years did you spend in the synagogue listening to uh, the prophet portions connected to the Torah portions? Oh, um, quite a number. <laughs> I mean, a lot of years. Did yeah. you get to the points even when you were young, when you were a young teenager? Could you could you start so, to be so, able to so see? actually it was it was even more than that because what would happen is you know uh, there would be these you know, Shabbat morning Saturday morning there'd be these, like two hour mm-hmm. prayer service mm-hmm. and in that pr- two hour prayer service they do a bunch of things most of it was prayers mm-hmm. but it would include reading from the Torah and reading from the prophets mm-hmm. and I won't lie I was really really bored by the prayers and so I would crack open the you know the, the little the little uh, reader mm-hmm. and uh, and I would be reading the sections in the in the Torah and the prophets because mm-hmm. you know the prayers I'm like well that's not the word of God and 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 mm-hmm. What's the point of me reciting the same thing week after week, week after week? That's at least how I felt. And so I preferred to read the word of God than to re- recite the words of men. So mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time mm-hmm. studying these things. Well, here's the thing. It says, I mean, I, no, no matter how you want to interpret it, w- would you agree that this is a phrase that's dealing with the oppression of the poor? Oh, absolutely. And every yeah. and every time I read this, I learn new things. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for me, when I read this, I, that there's a theme that, that goes throughout the Bible um, regarding yeah. the oppression of the poor. Oh, absolutely. That's the and, central theme. And that's the central theme that he's that he's bringing up here, which I think is is really interesting because um, I always get this concept in my mind that God is not up in heaven, unaware of what's happening. In fact, it's the exact opposite. He is aware of what's happening at, at every level of society from those that have been set aside like the orphan or the widow, or the person who doesn't have food. And we're going to talk about this in this passage, but it actually is encouraging to me that, um, that the, the God that we serve, you know, like I can say, it's not just, here's the word of the Lord for mm-hmm. what's coming the day of the Lord, but rather, here's the word of the Lord for what's happening right in your own community or right in your own mm-hmm. situation. And that's what Amos is um, obviously mm-hmm. is, is dealing with here. Yeah. Now the next verse. Is whoa, 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 next ahead, verse. Go ahead, go ahead, no, no, go ahead, go we spend the whole time on this verse. This yeah. is a really important verse. Mm-hmm. So we always have to ask the question. Sometimes maybe we forget, but we always have to ask the question: mm-hmm. Why did um, why did the people? And again, it's tradition. Mm-hmm. But why did the people who established the tradition choose this section mm-hmm. for the Torah portion? Mm-hmm. And what, do you have an answer, Keith? Give us give us an answer. I mean, I, when I read the story, okay. I mean, when I read the story, yeah. and I'm hearing about Joseph, and I'm hearing yeah, about all Genesis these things. thirty-seven yeah. through forty, th- yeah. thirty-seven one through forty twenty-three is Vayeshev the the Torah portion for this week, and it's about a righteous man being sold, mm-hmm. and he's being sold to the Egyptians, and that's exactly why they chose this section, mm-hmm. really because of this one phrase: um, "For three transgressions of Israel, before I will not revoke it, because they have sold for silver those who whose cause was just." That's in the JPS mm-hmm. um, King James, um, because they sold the righteous for silver, and, and in Hebrew it says tzaddik. Mm-hmm. They sold the righteous man for silver. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the rabbis, you know, read this or ancient Jews read this and they said, we're not allowed to read from the Torah portion because the Greeks will kill us if we do. So if we read this section, everyone will remember the Torah portion because mm-hmm. it's about uh, mentions a righteous man being sold for silver. And obviously in the original in the original context of Amos, the righteous man is whoever the poor was in the land at the time. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a specific righteous man. It's mm-hmm. what we call the collective singular. But in their 
their minds using the, the principle of association, they said that righteous man was Joseph. Mm-hmm. And you have um, to read the story of Joseph when you read the story of Joseph and you get a chance to see. Now, now here, here's something really interesting to me, which is, um, you know, selling a righteous man for silver. Um, you know, it's kind of like this, almost like a footnote in the history of Israel. But Jewish um, tradition has taken this to be a really, really big deal. Mm-hmm. So much so that there were these 10 rabbis who were put to death by the Romans during the Hadrianic persecutions, mm-hmm. roughly in the round of the time of Bar Kokhba, 132 to 135 AD, mm-hmm. and it ended in 138 with the death of Hadrian. And um, so so these 10 rabbis were put to death, and, and some of the rabbis came along and said, well, why did they die? They were perfectly righteous men. They shouldn't have died. Mm-hmm. And the answer they gave shocks many people to this very day. And, and I'm not saying this is true. I'm just mm-hmm. saying this is, it makes you think, makes me think. Why did the 10 rabbis die according to this tradition? Because the 10 brothers sold Joseph into slavery. Mm. And this was the punishment thousands of years later for that ancestral sin. Um, And then some rabbis, which here I I, I say, okay, I kind of get off the train (laughs) and say I can't agree with this. But, you know, at least I'm aware of the, you know, of the idea. Mm -hmm. They'll say um, not only was selling Joseph into slavery the result resulting in the uh, death of these 10 rabbis. But some rabbis have come along in the 20th century and said the Holocaust in the 20th century was a result of selling a righteous man into slavery, which even in Jude, even in rabbinical circles is very controversial and people have gotten very upset by that. But I think it's interesting. The point is we gloss over this. Yeah, they sold him to slavery. We're done with that. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of a big deal. Oh, kind of. <laughs> it's a major deal. So let's move on, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so it says here, those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless and turn aside the way of the humble. Now I want to stop there before we go to the yeah. next, the next phrase. So what image do you get when you see that? I mean, that's what it's talking about, but is there, is there something that you think of when I, when I, when I read that, I just think, okay, who are we, are we talking about the poor? Or are we talking about the people that oppress the poor? Obviously we're talking about the poor. Would you agree? Well, the oppressors are stomping on the poor exactly right <laughs> okay. and they're, they're panting after the very dust of the earth the head of the helpless i mean when i read that i was like oh, that seems a little you know almost a little confusing and also turn aside the way of the humble and so these people and again i'm using the nasb feel free to yeah i, I got i gotta stop you yeah there. Get, give us the so difference. so that's one way of translating it the way yeah. i would translate this um and this is a little controversial but this word shafim um which can mean panting or blowing blow mm-hmm. you know blowing wind can also mean trampling yes and, but only in these two, two of these verses in, in amos this one one in a later chapter so so then you'd get it with the translation those who trample the dust of the earth the heads of the of the, of the poor in other mm-hmm. words they're just grinding them into the ground stomping mm-hmm. on them mm-hmm. uh, and then they pervert the way of the of the meek of the mm-hmm. and really it's another word for poor what mm-hmm. we say is meek or humble mm-hmm. in this context it's actually poor so they're perverting the way of the of the of the poor and so think about what that means so the poor um often is is you know under the influence and control of these rich people and may want to do the righteous thing but might not have the you know might be forced in some ways to do uh, to do evil, mm-hmm. and so they're not just perverting themselves, you know, um, you know, sinning themselves. They're causing other people to sin mm-hmm. through this this uh, economic power they have. Well, can you keep reading this verse and have yeah. me to the end? Because I thought this was this was something that made me kind of slow down. Would you read that in the next section? It says, "In a man and his father, they will go to the to uh, the girl in order to desecrate my holy name." Mm-hmm. And and when I read that in uh, my NASB, it said, and actually there was an assumption that I made when I read it yeah. first, and then when I looked at Hebrew. I saw something different, and you just you just basically yeah. shared what the difference was. Mm-hmm. And it says, and, uh, and a man and his father resort to the to the to the same girl in order to purvey my holy name. But if I look at, I think it is in um, yes in to uh, Amos in the NIV, something else comes up. It says here, uh, it says, sorry. Ah, here's what it says in the NIV, which actually caused my confusion. Yeah. It says, father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. And so when I think of that, there's sort of an image that comes into my mind. Yeah. It's, it's like specifically talking about a father and son. And I went back to thinking, oh, what's the what's the, uh, the Torah um, admonition on that, etc. But when I was looking at it further, something else came out. And I just want to throw this out. Yeah. It's something to discuss. Uh, speaking of the father and the son, 
going to the same girl. If we're thinking in terms of what's happening, yeah, can at we that stop time, using euphemisms? Yeah, what's going no, on? No, no, I'm saying, I'm saying here. To tell the people. What, what, no, 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 I'm not. That, that's it's not a euphemism. Euphemism. I'm actually saying what the Hebrew says. Going to the same girl. When I'm thinking of that, I thought immediately of again in the Torah, Deuteronomy twenty three seventeen. If you can go to that, okay. Um, it says here, none of the daughters of Israel shall be uh, a cult prostitute, nor shall any of the sons of Israel be a cult prostitute. Now, in terms of what was happening at that time, the the Baal worship, all the things that were going on at that time, the father and the son don't represent, it's not like a father and a son going and, and, and being with, with the girl, but rather the father and the son representing both men and boys, sons and, and, and you know, fathers and sons together going to this, this place where this is actually taking place. So when Deuteronomy... I, I, I would to, think it literally means the father and son are having relations with the same woman. Well, I mean, it's... it's Because I mean, that's referred to in, in, in uh, Leviticus mm -hmm. uh, 18 and 20. And, and in those chapters, there's this idea of desecrating the name. Absolutely. And so, and so the, the, you know, he's basically taking these, this, this concept from Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. Okay. But, but, but the idea, is, what I'm saying is that the father and the son, in, in other words, in the men of the community, men, whether it's father and son literally, mm -hmm. or father and son meaning, the, it's like talking about what happened in, the, uh, in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. The men of the community. Like if, if, if he would have used the phrase, the father and the son mm. X, what would that mean? What would that represent? So if in the bigger picture, what's happening is collectively, this is what the men are doing. And I mean, the next phrase, the next phrase actually goes even further. Well, and, and um, just to give people an exact verse. So and, and you're saying it's prostitution and it may be, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. um, meaning it could, it could be even like, uh, you know, a father marries a woman, then he dies and, the, mm -hmm. and then the son goes and marries the same woman. Mm -hmm. Um, that also is forbidden in the Torah. Mm -hmm. At Leviticus 18, verse 7, it says, The nakedness of your father and the nakedness of your mother you will not uncover. She is your mother, you will not uncover her nakedness. Mm -hmm. um, then the, it says in verse 8, The nakedness of your father's wife you will not uncover is your father's nakedness. Meaning right. even after your father's dead, you cannot marry your um, Absolutely. your your father's uh, widow. And vice versa, he can't come and marry his daughter-in-law, which, which is what the Canaanites would do. They'd say, oh, you know, the daughter... My, you know, my, my son died and, and there's this girl who, and we actually have the example of Judah mm -hmm. with, uh, with Tamar mm -hmm. and there, there was an issue of prostitution, um, that, you know, she's like, okay, well, who's going to marry me? You know, your son died and another son died. And finally she's like, okay, I'm going to go for the father-in-law. Mm -hmm. And, and that's actually a sin according to Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think he was referring to here in Amos. Okay. But yeah. So 2.8 says, can I, can I go? To yeah, please. Says, on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar, and in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Mm -hmm. Who have been fined. So, you know, when you look at that, I say, okay, so now again, and again, this is what's, this is kind of what's been kind of fun. So we did the, we did the, uh, prop, we did the um, Torah pearls. Original and when we did the Torah pearls, we had to read literally yeah. every verse <laughs> yeah. and that's why sometimes it would take us uh -huh. two hours or two and a half hours but the blessing of that yeah. was is to hear the torah so that when you then hear something that sounds like or yeah. you know that is related to it your mind goes back at least for me my mind goes mm -hmm. back so that's the question that i would ask is that okay here's this shepherd yeah. who's hearing the word of god and god is not a man that he should lie nor son of man to change his mind does he speak and not act promise and not fulfill numbers 23 whatever that is Something. The point is, he's not going to change. Mm -hmm. When he speaks, yeah, he's going to be speaking his word. And even though that might be something fresh for that day, oftentimes it'll be relating back to what he already said. Yeah. And so that's again when we when we look at these verses talking about garments taken as pledges, we can look there. The verses. I mean, you might have it right there. Let me just see what. Can, it is. can we talk about the garments for a minute? Absolutely. And, and I'm sure we've spoken about this in the original Torah pearls mm -hmm. and other contexts. So the people were really, really poor, mm -hmm. and there's a commandment in Deuteronomy. Uh, it talks about if you if you you know take someone's garment Exodus as, twenty two twenty six if is, you take your neighbor's okay. cloak as a pledge you are to return to him before the sun sets wonderful mm -hmm. okay and what they would do is they t and the reason is because he doesn't have another one mm -hmm. and so they would take the you know take the cloak basically this is, this, this, this isn't is amazing though think about that yeah. like here so here you've taken the cloak okay that you, you can do that yeah. but give it back at night right <laughs> and that's because it, he he's cold mm -hmm. I mean literally uh, they didn't have anything else mm -hmm. to um, to sleep with and um and what's really cool and yeah it says uh uh it's, yeah exodus twenty two twenty six in the hebrew says and what else shall he sleep therefore he cries out to me i will pay heed for mm -hmm. i am compassionate and there's this great uh ancient hebrew inscription mm -hmm. um w where it talks about this guy who uh who lost his he, he owed money 
mm-hmm. and the the debtor came. And this is written in Paleo Hebrew from wow. like you know seventh century BC. And he writes, you know, this letter to the magistrate saying, you know, I, I owed this debt, and the guy came and he took my cloak, and I and I, I, I need it back, and please return my cl- cloak. Mm-hmm. And and maybe he rightfully owes the cloak because it's collateral, mm-hmm. but he doesn't have the right to keep it. That's the point. And if we if we apply that to modern um, concepts of you know of, of <laughs> I mean, think about that. Yeah. You know, um, our modern concept of banking and mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. collateral and things like that. It's a different story. Oh, it's definitely a different. It's story. not biblical. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, uh, it goes further. Um, yeah. It says that on the garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. Now, I'm going to tell you, Nehemiah, yeah. why I'm going back to the previous verse, and we can discuss this. Yeah. So the next in context, it says, on the garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. Now, what does it say in Hebrew? In verse uh, verse 8. Verse 8. Um, it says, uh, yeah, upon uh, pledged garments, they uh, stretch uh, by every altar and the wine of, of of fines they drink in the house of their gods. Mm-hmm. In the house of their gods, does it say? Yeah, or it could be translated the house of their god. Uh, they're, they're, they're god. Let me ask this yeah. question, just from practicality. Yeah. Is he speaking about the the, the, the the house of God at that time that they're going to in Jerusalem? Oh, are they definitely talking not. about something it, no. else? When it says uh, by every altar, presumably it's referring to the high places, which were all Absolutely. over. Uh, Dan and Bethel were the two major ones, but mm. on top of every hill, uh, hill, hill and every, every leafy tree, tree. They, had, they had one of these um, high okay. places. So I want to throw this out. We don't usually get into any conflict. We just have yeah. a little bit of back and forth. But okay. again, when I'm reading it in context, I'm thinking, okay, we're talking about these garments that are taking. We're talking about the poor. We're talking about them doing these things at these altars. We're talking about them going to the house, to the house of their God, which is not the house, the house uh-huh. of God. And so in the middle of talking about the poor and what they do with the poor, there's this, this phrase again, back to the, the father and the son. So the issue was what I was looking at was the fact that, okay, so what's the connection between what, what it is that's happening? The, the cult prostitute, whatever that they're, whatever they're doing with Baal worship, et cetera. That's why I kind of I kind of focus on it, and I, I completely agree in terms of the man, the the fathers and the son doing what they're doing as far as against the Torah, but also in context, what is actually happening at that time, and what is Amos calling these people to? And we're going to get to that, but this it was kind of like one of those deals where you see a sentence or a phrase in the in the sandwiched in between two other phrases. So here's the first phrase. The first phrase is, um, let me see here. Let me just do this. The first phrase is, he's speaking of the poor. This is what's going on with the poor. This is what's going on with the humble. Then it says, a man and his father resort to the same girl. This is what it says in NASB, in order to profane my name. And then it continues, on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. What altars? Where are these altars? And in the house of their God, they drink wine of those who have been fine. Meaning, here's the person that's lost their, 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 uh, you know, their, their materials, their, their physical things. And they're continuing to do it, so that's why I just wanted to throw that out. I'm not... and, there, and there's definitely a, a contrast here between the the, the downtrodden poor mm-hmm. and the um, you know the the rich who are you know living doing what they're li- doing. living it up exactly. at the expense of the poor, having having in an unrighteous their, way, having their, exactly having their way, doing their thing, partying and and, and drinking yeah. their wine and. You know, reveling with whoever and however. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, except mm-hmm. that they're doing it at the expense of the poor mm-hmm. and not taking care of the poor at the mm-hmm. same time. Not mm-hmm. only are they not taking care of the poor, they're crushing the poor and, st- you know, and extorting their money. Mm-hmm. Now, now, can, uh, can I go to verse 9? Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 9 catches my attention. And why? Because we talked about it before. Yeah. But whenever I, see, whenever I see this introduction, when he says, uh, he says this little phrase, he says, but anochi. I can't help but think about, again, the introduction yeah. when he uses that phrase. Now, again, we also see ani, I am, I am, I am. So he uses the word anochi, and he does it at the beginning of verse 9, and he does it at the beginning of verse 10. Mm-hmm. And by the way, a question, is this also the same uh, 9 and 10 in the Hebrew text? Are, there, are they off yeah. at all? Yeah, okay. same, same verse. Awesome. So let's, let's just go with this. Um, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. <clears throat> Can you do, could you, would you be willing to do this? Give us an elevator answer. This is the elevator answer. If you get on an elevator and you're going up to the 10th floor, and I say to you, hey, Nehemiah, I was reading in uh, Amos, and it says something about he did something to the Amorite. What does that mean, the Amorite? What what, what was the story about the Amorites? The Amorites were uh, one of the main Canaanite tribes, Mm -hmm. and God took Israel out of Egypt, took them through the desert, and then brought them into the land of the Canaanites who had Mm -hmm. sinned. And and we're actually told in Genesis 15 that the Amorites, uh, you know, that that it wasn't time for Abraham to get the land Mm -hmm. because the Amorites were in the land and their sin hadn't been completed yet. 
Mm. And he wasn't going to unjustly, unrighteously take the land away from the Amorites. But after 400 years, he told them their sin will be complete. I know the future. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get their land. That is something. Because that's, it's one of the verses. It's one of the verses that I just have to tell you. It's like I see God with this clock. Mm -hmm. And he's got like, you know, this is when this is going to happen. He knows exactly when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, he gives us a little hint that, in fact, he's he's looking at this clock. And so he says, their sin has not yet reached its, yeah. you know. Genesis 15, 16. 15, 16, which is an amazing verse. And they yeah. like, oh, so you mean there's something that actually has to happen before the next thing happens? I mean, that's, right. I don't know. There, there, there's a lot about that. God's got a plan. Come on with that. <laughs> So, and but then the next verse he says, he says, Anuchi, I'm the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, you can't read that and not think about Exodus chapter yeah. 20. Because what does he say? I am the Lord your God in English who brought you from the land of Egypt. You see this phrase here. Yeah. And again, it says, I am the Lord who brought you to e Egypt. Now, I want to, I just want to do something. In, in 2.10, I just noticed this. In 2 chapter, uh, in my NIV, it says... It says, I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you 40 years in the desert to give you the land of the Amorites, referring back mm -hmm. to what you just said. Yeah. But in two, um, oh man, I cannot find it. A different phrase that they use, I don't know if it's the King James Version or if it's uh, the JPS, that doesn't, if you, if, you, if you read it in English, it doesn't immediately remind you of what mm -hmm. he says in Exodus chapter 20. But I'm not going to hold us on that. Do you have anything you want to say about that? Um, no, I mean, you know, I think it's, I always find it really interesting when the prophets are referring back to the ancient history of Israel, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the next part, we will have something to say, and we're going to fight to see who gets to talk about it, okay? Okay. So in the next verse, in 2.11, he says, then I raised up some of your sons to be prophets. He says, I raised up some of your sons to yeah. be prophets, and some of your young men to be Nazarites. Is this not so? Oh, sons of Israel, declares Jehovah. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I was like, man. So just from timing, mm -hmm. you got almost speaking about this. But in biblical terms, and you can check this on your computer. But I, if I'm wrong, then I'm going to have to be rebuked on the uh, on our on our podcast here. All right. Let's do that. Let's rebuke him. <laughs> but I think, Nehemiah, just yeah. from reading, that you don't really hear much about the word Nazarite or Nazarites from like judges when you're having, dealing with Samson. Literally from the judge, the time of Samson, after mm -hmm. that, between that and the time of Amos, let me know if you can find it in another. Um, the word Nazarite. The, yeah, Nazarite. Because yeah. what the, the, the point is, is that what this showed me, and, and what, check your check before I go too far, because it could be embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, that, that, you're right. That the idea is that you've got this process going, and we hear this wonderful story, mm -hmm. amazing story about Samson. And Samson, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail. You can read it for yourself and judges... Uh, 16, 16, 13 and 16, 13 and 16, where, where, where God is going to say, there's going to be this, 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 this young man that is going to grow up. Don't let his hair be cut. He won't, he will not drink wine. He's going to be a Nazarite. Right. And then we see the story, which is such a powerful story. Is that <clears throat> in any of the prophet pearls? Do we get to do that one at all? Anytime? I mean, oh yeah, I, I think that one is in there somewhere. Maybe. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, what's <laughs> interesting is you see that story and at the end of that story, we don't hear an about another Nazarite. Yeah. Until Amos. And mm -hmm. th that doesn't mean they didn't exist. Right. So what he's saying here is, and some of the young men to be, so in other words, it was still happening. It's just that we haven't heard the story. It about probably it. wasn't a very common thing. It wasn't a very common thing. But I just yeah. think it's interesting that there, we, there's such a big gap. How many years yeah. that is? A whole uh, bunch. Uh, that's a bunch yeah. of years. But I mean, obviously, they, Five, they were existing. Five, six hundred, something like that. So yeah. when he said it, it wasn't like they didn't know what he was talking about. And they didn't. Well, because it's in that. the Torah. I mean, Absolutely. It's in Numbers, is it chapter six? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, chapter six. For those who want to find the prophet pearls, or the Torah original Torah pearls, original section. Torah pearls. So, so what did they do yeah. with these Nazarites, and what they did do with these prophets? Yeah. Two things. You can talk about this verse, yeah. verse twelve. They made the Nazarite do what? Drink wine. The opposite of what it was that, that he was supposed to do. And yeah. what's the purpose of the prophet? To, to prophesy. prophesy. Yeah. And and he says you shall not prophesy. Now you brought the verse yeah. in Amos chapter seven where the prophet where Amos he literally comes, said to him, he "Get says, out of here." I don't want to hear this. Yeah. This, is not, this is not acceptable. He actually said, go prophesy somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> now think about that. So, no, <laughs> not now, here. I, I just want to stop for a second. And stop me. Um, is there ever a time where people say, I just don't want to hear the word of God? Oh, is there it, a time? I, doesn't it happen every day? I, I'm just saying. I mean, think about that. Can, can I share a, a really controversial story? Yes. 
where um, and this is some actually happened here in Charlotte, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody told us this story about how she was involved in this in this uh, church, and they uh, and it was like I guess we call it, um, Episcopalian, and they brought a man all the way from Kenya to preach at the church. He was like the archbishop there of, yep. of, of that denomination. The story. Yeah, and um, and he's he's in Charlotte. He's at the hotel. They're about to pick him up and drive him over to the the church to speak on a Sunday morning, and they said, "Well, there, there's been a there's been an emergency meeting of the church council or whatever it is, and uh, we we can only let you speak on one condition that you promise not to read from the Bible, because there was a certain passage that he wanted that they don't know whether he was going to read it or not, but they were afraid he could read a certain passage from the Bible. So they said, "You can preach, but as long as it's not from the Bible." And I heard that I'm like, "How can this even be?" Can I go a little further? Sure. There are there are actually uh, uh, people now that um, it's my understanding that if you if you read certain passages from the Bible, uh, you can be uh, considered to be uh, at risk in terms of your uh, your your standing in the community. Um, there are certainly many denominations. I happen to come from a denomination. That presently is considered a bit liberal. They're so liberal they don't bother me. You're from a liberal I'm from United How Methodist. That you know what I mean? <laughs> what? I, and people say, "Well, Keith, why are you still? Why are you still Methodist?" I'm still waiting for them to decide that they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna kick me out. The blessing for me is I worked extremely hard. Can I just tell you how hard I worked? I went through, you know, went to high school. Now, now, just just to understand, you're a Methodist elder, which I'm, means you're like a layman. They no, appointed. no, no, no. Listen, no, isn't listen. that what elder means in some churches? No, that might be that. Okay, but not Methodist. for the Methodists. Oh, no, okay. so the United Methodists. I know some people are cringing. Why does he got to talk about the Methodists? I'm still trying to reach the Methodists. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so three years of high school, four years of college, yeah. three years of uh, of uh, graduate work, Trinity Evangelical. I should say it like you say Hebrew. What did I Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I don't say it like you that. I went to Hebrew University. Hebrew University. <laughs> <laughs> no. Three Three years there, and then from there, it's another two years, another two years of yeah. the process. What mm-hmm. I appreciate about the United mm-hmm. Methodist process is that there's accountability. Mm-hmm. What I don't appreciate about the United Methodist um, denomination is they focus more on the book of discipline than on the book, mm-hmm. uh, the word of God. And the book of discipline is not the Bible. No, it's not the Bible. In fact, they, it's, they, they, okay. they, they talk about the rules and regu- the regulations. But again, this idea to tell someone, do not speak the word of God, and I'm, I'm concerned Presently, as I see in many denominations, there are fewer and fewer pastors that are opening up the word of God and preaching the word mm. of God. They're being political. They're having to do all these other things and jump through all these hoops. And there's right. entire denominations mm. that are saying, no matter what, make sure that you don't share these particular things because they're out of context. And, and, it's and, old. Yeah. And I heard that if you read like uh, in certain countries, if you publicly, even if you're like an ordained pastor and you publicly or especially... If you publicly read certain passages from the Bible, then you could be prosecuted for a hate crime. Mm. And I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about Canada. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, they, in the situation back then, they were say, they were telling the Nazarites, break your vow. Yeah. And they were telling the prophets, don't prophesy. Um, yeah. And then, he, and then he says. To this very day. To this very day. Behold, yeah. I'm weighted down beneath you mm-hmm. as a wagon is weighted down when filled with sheaves. Mm-hmm. Who's weighted down? Who is he speaking about here? What's what's going on here, Nahemi? I mean, yeah. this so is where you got to... Let me read you the JPS. Okay. I, I will slow your movements as a wagon is slowed when it is uh, full of cut grain. Boy, that's a good <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, and, and, and here here's the difference. Is it that Yehovah is weighted down? Yeah, that's exactly. Or is it he's going to weight us down? Exactly. You know, you're you're going to tell my prophets and my and my Nazarites to, to defy what they've been called to do? Then you're going to have a hard time. Mm. Man, and that man. actually fits the next verse, meaning this, you know, the way you read it makes no sense in the context. Mm-hmm. Read it. Read the next verse. So flight shall fail the swift, the strong shall find no strength, and the warrior shall not save his life. The bowman shall not hold his ground, and the feet, fleet-footed sh- shall not escape, nor the horseman save his life. Mm. Even the most stout-hearted warrior shall run away unarmed that day, declares Jehovah. Mm. So you're going to defy my prophets and, and uh, give drink to my Nazarites, force them to, actually in the Hebrew it says force them to drink. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then you are going to, I'm, I'm going to remove my protection from you. Man, oh man. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there's, a, there's a shift here uh, yeah. in 3.1. If it, now, it, yeah. he says, he <clears throat> says in, in 3.1, he says, now hear this word. Which Yehovah has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family, which he brought up from the land of Egypt. And then the next, now this is connected, so you can definitely respond to this. But when you hear these words, the, the entire family, and then he says, you only have I chosen among all the families of the earth 
What do you think of when you hear families of the earth? What do you think of? I mean, well, I think of Genesis uh, 10 and 11 exactly. after the flood where the nations are, are separated out into 70 different nations. Mm -hmm. And one of those is, you know, the family um, that eventually becomes Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And, you know, meaning and, and that's actually an image that, you know, I grew up with that. It's really interesting. It's tradition. It's not historical, but it, but it's an interesting image based on this, that that um, that, you know, before God chose Israel for Mount Sinai, that he went to all the other nations of the world and offered them and they rejected it. Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, that actually didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it brings up the point. OK, there's all these nations. In the world. Why wasn't it the Yanomami of, uh, of 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 Brazil, of the Amazon rainforest? Mm -hmm. Why wasn't it these other, you know, the, the Han of, of China? Mm -hmm. Why was it Jacob from uh from, you know, from Israel, this small little, you know, family of shepherds. Why mm -hmm. was it? Mm -hmm. And what we're told in scripture is, is because of God's relationship with Abraham, mm. that there was this covenant he made with Abraham. That's, I mean, we could go. Yeah. People make sure that you go and listen to where we spoke for like, I think it was an hour and a half mm -hmm. <laughs> in, uh, in the original prophet, uh, original Torah pearls. Because what I, I want to yeah. say, I mean, I actually want to take a break if we can. Sure. Um, right now, right before we go into these last six verses, um, is that one of the things that's been really, really interesting is just to see the journey that you and I have been on. And now we're at this place where we're, where we're doing this. We're committed right now to doing this for an entire year. But yeah. during that year, what do you have going on? In other words, so people oh listen my. to you. <laughs> so lot. people are going to listen to you. And, and I, guess, yeah. I guess I want people to understand this. And I don't want to make too much of a, big, a, a bigger deal than it is. But it really takes time. It takes effort. It takes mm -hmm. energy. It takes resources to do what we're doing. But this isn't the only thing mm -hmm. that we're doing. So what else are you doing? Yeah. So I've got my ministry, uh, Macor Hebrew Foundation, and the main website is nehemiahswall.com. And, um, you know, we're doing a lot on that. You know, I'm, uh, we, we've got teachings coming out, written teachings and um, audio teachings, podcasts, mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of things coming out. We're doing the monthly Q&A mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, the trumpeters who are standing with me on the wall um i we have what we call the support team studies mm -hmm. um and you know we're, we're just putting out a lot of information one of the things we're doing is really developing the website getting the information out there mm -hmm. and it's it's <laughs> pretty much like a full-time job it's, yeah. it's actually a you know it's funny i was talking to someone about you know who has a nine to five job and and he's like you know yeah you you can you know work whenever you want and I'm like, yeah, from the moment I wake up at night to the moment I go to sleep at night, literally. Yeah. It's funny because I'm here with you. We're actually, as those who don't know, we're actually recording this um, in advance because we're about to go our separate ways. I'm going to be yeah. on the other side of the earth. Nehemiah is going to be, yeah. we don't know where. He's the wandering Jew. What, what city will it be next? I don't know. Uh, but we're here and, and we do get to see what we're doing. And I do get to watch you. Yeah. Doing what you know, one thing I really appreciate, Nehemiah, about what you do is that you've got all this information and you're, you're finding vehicles by which people can actually in, encounter the information. So mm -hmm. this is not a ministry minute. I want you to talk a little bit, if you yeah. can, also about the platform by which people can interact with what, 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 you're, what you're doing. And by the platform, you mean the website? Yeah, not just yeah. the website. Oh. It's, it's podcast. The, yeah. yeah. Oh, one of the things we have is the you know, iTunes. Uh, and we're now putting out the, you know, this audio blog. And um, one of the things I do ask people is to go to iTunes and give us ratings and reviews because that really helps get the message out in front of other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, us do it, recording a, <laughs> an audio, no one listening to it. That you know, that's only half of the ministry. Half of the other half is actually getting this message out. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. There's a lot of people listening to him. You know, I think between us, we're, between our, our website bfainternational.com and with nehemiahswall.com, we have thousands of people that are actually listening. We're yeah. really appreciative. I want to challenge those that that are listening to consider something. We're actually four weeks away from the end of this calendar year, and I've made a really big decision in the BFA, and that is that I'm not going to chase the train. What does chasing the train mean? Chasing the train means you establish ahead of time what you're going to do, and then later you try to find out how to pay for it. <laughs> so we have been doing like that. Yeah, we've been <laughs> doing that for this year, and it's brought, brought amazing re results. I want to thank all the people who stepped in um, to support us through projects that we've been doing. The last one of this year, after we've done Scripture Bites, after we're in the midst of uh, Prophet Pearls, which you and I are doing, obviously, for the next year, is the Hanukkah Project, which is actually a few days away if all goes according to plan. A few days away from being released uh, for everyone to watch. It's in the spirit of the Christmas special we did last year. Uh, through the now the time we did a Christmas year? special last year. It was huge. Thousands of people really? saw it. So we believe the same thing for Hanukkah. But I will say something. We did this project. We had we started doing it without knowing exactly how it all would 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 be taken care of. 
We are by faith doing that. So I'm actually challenging people, if you would consider this as we end, end this year, to go to BFAinternational.com. If you are a free member, I want you to ch- I want to challenge you just to pray about potentially becoming a part of the premium content library. That is a minimum of $9.99 a month that does two things. One, you're going to get access to everything we have, and there's now over 50 things going on. But two, it's going to help us prepare for this upcoming year where we have some things in the queue, as I call it, that are even more amazing than anything I've, I've done before that we've done. So those that are already free members, consider that. If you're not a member of BFAinternational.com, go to the Academy. You'll see a little button that says, Enter the Academy. And when you enter the Academy, there's going to be two options. One, you can be a free member. And if you're, un- if you're unable to do anything, please become a free member because you're going to get a chance to get email updates and see a whole bunch of things. But if you have the ability to do it, I am sincerely asking you to consider uh, becoming a part of the Premium Content Library because that's going to help us help you. It's going to help us do the things that we're doing right now, reaching people around the world with good information, inspiration, and revelation, inspiring people to build a biblical foundation for their faith. That is what the website is about, and you can help us do that in this upcoming year. So let's do it. My goal is very simple. 300 people. we got thousands of people listening. If 300 people will become premium content library folks, we can start producing something that's going to be amazing in 2015 while I continue to work with you on Profit Pearl. So yeah. that is the that is my ministry minute. Can we continue? Yeah. Here we go, guys. We're in Amos 3, verse 1. Can you read it, Nehemiah? We just talked about the entire family. Um, the thing that you, yeah. you talked about in terms of the, the, being the family, uh, the family that, that God sort of chose, but he chose this small little group, mm-hmm. and he's doing this amazing thing. And I'm reminded when I re- when I read this, I think about what does the family do? The family ends up being the picture of what God wants for the world, and so how He deals with that family and how that family uh, interacts with the world. The idea is that they would actually um, be able to reach others, people around the world, um, with mm. with that message. Yeah. So, uh, but it says here. Then this is the hard part. Uh, you only have I chosen among the families of the earth. With that choosing comes a great accountability. Mm-hmm. Therefore, and this just seems like a downer. It seems like a downer. You're my family. I've picked you as my family. I'm going to punish you. <laughs> I mean, when I read that, I'm like, well, maybe, you know. That's yeah, it's, it's not all, it's not all um, you know, roses. It's not. Um, and it reminds me, this brings me back to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. Mm-hmm. And this is just after uh, the two sons of Aaron, Nadav and Abihu, they brought this uh, strange fire and they were immediately burned up on the spot. Mm. And it's like, what? <laughs> Wait yeah. a minute. We're the holy koanim. We're the holy priests. Why did this happen? Mm-hmm. And here's the answer. Is that Moses said to Aaron, this is what Yehovah meant when he said, uh, through those near to me, I show myself holy mm. and gain glory before all the people. Mm. So if you want to be holy, you want to be a kohen, you want to be a nation of priests, there could, there's going to be consequences. Mm. You know, you have to glorify God in everything that you do. And if you don't, then there's going to be there's going to be consequences to what oh, you do. Man, oh man, I'll tell you something. That's uh, that is that is uh, what do you yeah. call it? Sobering. Well, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, they both have these large sections which are aren't just the blessing. The mm-hmm. Torah is not just the blessing; it's the blessing and the curse. Mm-hmm. If you follow it, here's the blessing. If you don't, here's the curse. Mm-hmm. And so, on the one hand, Israel has been chosen to be this light to the nations. We talked about in Isaiah, yeah. and you know, and, and to be a nation of priests to to you know minister to the world. And teach them about God's covenant and God's Torah. At the same time, there's this awesome responsibility, this Amen. very heavy responsibility. Amen. Amen. Well, um, this this next verse actually, Nehemiah, is the key verse uh, for I, at least. This is the verse that. Uh, how can I say we preach this verse around the world? And I actually yeah, want people. Literally. I want to. I want to challenge you to help people do something. We're going to pick the word of the week. Yeah. And this is not an easy word of the week. It's not a simple a shalom. Shin Lamed Mem, it's Shalom. Right. It's a little bit Shin more Lamed complicated, Bob, but, yeah. but I think that uh, I, well, the three-letter root, I was giving the three-letter oh, okay. root. Yeah. Oh, he well, always corrects me. Well, there's a see? three-letter root okay, here. Okay, 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 but it's, it's, it's not as easy. But I want, I want you to, I want to read the verse, if I can, yeah. in uh, Amos 3.3. 3. It says, uh, and I want to read it from the NIV, if it's all right. Mm-hmm. Amos 3.3. 3. I got a phone call from some folks that's, that brought this verse, and they challenged me. And it says... Do two walk together unless, and they said to me, do two walk together unless they have agreed? And, mm-hmm. and, and they said to me, how can you walk with this guy, Nehemiah Gordon? He doesn't think like you. He doesn't act like you. He doesn't, well, I shouldn't say that. He doesn't think like you. He, well, actually, you do think. He doesn't believe like you. <laughs> we started finding all these things that yeah. were different about us, and they challenged me. 
And you actually had some people challenge you. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I said, here's the verse they're bringing to him. Mm-hmm. How can we walk together unless we agree? And you, yeah. you did a radical thing. Yeah. You said, and you didn't even know the answer ahead of time. Yeah. You, you were in humility said, well, let's just look in the Hebrew. Let's look at the verse and see yeah. what it says. So could you yeah. do two things? One, read the verse. Mm-hmm. And two, bring the word of the week. Sure. So um, it says, Hayel uh, yachtav. Can two walk together? Bilti im noadu. Mm. Uh, literally, if they without them having met one another, mm. that's what it literally says. Without having met one another, mm-hmm. and the word there is uh, the word of the week is noadu, mm-hmm. nun vav ayin dalid vav. Very easy, Keith. Only six letters. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying oh, no, again. One, two, nice three, four, slow five letters. Sorry, five letters. Yep. Nun vav ayin dalid vav noadu. And the root there is ya'ad, yud ayin dalet. Mm. Now, you know this root. You know it from the word moadim. Mm-hmm. Moed is an appointed time. Mm-hmm. And what does an appointed time really mean? It's a time that you're set to meet with someone. Mm-hmm. And then you also have oel moed, the tent of meeting. Yes, sir. Which is the word, same word, moed, from the same root, mm-hmm. root yud ayin dalet. So no'adu is the nifal form, for those who know Hebrew grammar. Um, and it's uh, what they call the... the um, you know, it, it's where you do one to another. It's uh, no adu means they met one another. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the meetings of nifal. It's like nilcham is to enter into battle with someone. Mm-hmm. So no adu is they met one another. So what, what's the so now that they know the word of the week? What's the message of this? Uh, well, for me, I, I'll, I'll tell you what happened for me. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to back up and tell you thanks for for giving that information to people. Yeah. There are so many people. More and more people in the have been 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 sending notes and messages and, yeah. and thing saying. That they want to learn the language, they want yeah. to have the access to the language. One of the reasons uh, that people have said this is that we we're in week nine of Scripture Bites, and every single week in Scripture Bites, if you haven't heard Scripture Bites, you go to the front of the deal, you you watch it, and what it does is gives you a chance to interact with the actual Hebrew language. Mm-hmm. And there's a thing called grammar alert, and the grammar alert comes up, and people say, "Oh, what's that?" What you just did was uh, when you brought that up, it, it made me say, "Okay." What does the word mean and what does it mean for me? So the idea of having met one another is we're thinking, okay, how do I meet Nehemiah? Is that just, you know, I just call him up and say, let's have a meeting? Or do I try to find the, the, the place of commonality, the right. common ground, the common ground right. where we can meet one another? And that's exactly what you and I decided. Right. We said, okay, there are some differences. Mm-hmm. There are some different ways that we think, different ways that we believe. But what are the things that are common? And there's one thing, 100%. No questions asked that you and I both uh, understand to be important that we're calling, and that is on on the Word of God in its language, in its history, and its context. And oh, that's man. what this this entire program is. About. Now let's go back look, and look back at the King James version, which is what caused your people the most mm-hmm. trouble. Where it says, "Can two walk together except they be agreed?" So the translator has kind of paraphrased it, mm-hmm. and really what they were getting at is they can't walk together unless first they agree to walk with one another. Exactly. Whereas what the way this has been taken in, in, in the church that you come from and, and by many is that um, if you don't have theological agreement with someone, you can't have a, you physically, a walk you of spirit with yeah, them. You, you can't, can't spiritually walk with somebody yes, no question. unless you agree with them uh, on matters of doctrine. And the result is 33,000 different Christian denominations mm-hmm. based on, you know, not only this verse, but mm-hmm. but the, the mentality that went into misinterpreting this verse. What, what, and really what it's mm-hmm. about is the exact opposite. So in the context, what Amos is talking about it, it, as we'll read on, we'll see, mm. is look, th- there's no such thing as a coincidence mm. that things happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. You can't have two people walk together unless they first meet. Mm-hmm. Then they'll walk together. And he goes and he brings a series of things. Tell us what those that, are. I mean, those so, are all right, so let's go through them. So it's a series of things where you may look at that and say, oh, yeah, that, that, there's nothing to that. But he's saying, no, if two people walk together, obviously it's because they met. And it says, well, a, a lion roar in the, in the, in the forest... Uh, and does and he does not have any uh, prey. Mm-hmm. Will the um, young lion cry out with his, uh, the voice from his den if he has not captured something? Mm-hmm. Meaning, if you hear a lion roaring, that's because there's some food involved. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's roaring over the food. In other words, if people are walking, there's a reason. They come together and agreed. They, 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 they've they've come they've come together on the common ground yes. and they started walking to each mm-hmm. other. It wasn't a coincidence. Mm-hmm. And it's not for no reason that the lion is roaring. Mm-hmm. The lion, lion's roaring for a reason. Then it says, "Can a bird fall into a snare upon the earth?" Where uh, King James says, "Where no gin is for him," I don't even know what that is. I'm going to read it in, in Hebrew. Um, <laughs> can, can a bird uh, fall in a trap upon the earth, and there is no snare? I mean, and the, what, the way they would trap uh, birds mm-hmm. uh, is they would have these little, very you know, uh, very thin strings, and mm-hmm. and the 
bird would stick its leg in there and it'd get caught, you know, with the, the, mm -hmm. the spring um, of, the, of the tree. So it's saying if, if the bird's caught, it's because there's a snare. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, where are we now? Six. Um, yeah. Um, does a trap spring up from the ground unless it has caught something? Mm -hmm. So these things aren't random events. They're they're happening for mm -hmm. a reason. Mm -hmm. That says when, when a shofar is blown in the city. Wait a minute, Nehemiah. It doesn't say that. It says when a trumpet is blown in a city. It does. That's what it in says. In Hebrew, it says shofar. So trumpet means shofar. Uh, not always. There's also chatzotza, which is a silver trumpet. It's a That's different right. type of thing in Numbers chapter 10. Come on, I'm giving you a softball here. But, okay. <laughs> but here it's shofar. Blown, and there's it, also a, uh, a different type of yovel, which is a, a it, like a, a kudu uh, shofar. I love um, that. So, uh, uh, yeah, when a shofar is blown in the city, shall a nation, uh, shall a people not uh, tremble? Uh, and what, what that means yeah, is, you know, we, we think of the shofar as this theological thing. That, and it is. Meaning at Mount Sinai, when they heard the voice and they heard the shofar blowing, mm -hmm. so it has theological or, or, or religious significance, but it also had a very practical significance. When the enemy came, you blew the shofar to warn them. And the modern equivalent of, it's funny, in, in modern Israel, in, in southern Israel, the equivalent of the shofar is this, um, this it's not even a siren, it's this uh, announcement over the loudspeaker Tseva Edom, Tseva Edom. It's a very calm kind of thing, but when you, when you hear that, um, you know that you have uh, you have about 15 seconds till a rocket falls. Mm -hmm. And it's a great story. Tell I was them what I, Seba Edom is. Oh, uh, color red, color red. Yes. Um, and that's because in southern Israel, they've been under bombardment from Gaza since 2005 mm -hmm. and possibly even 2004. And, and, and at first they would have these air raid sirens and they were at all hours of the day in the middle of the night and people were getting, you know, very, irritated. very, not just irritated. Mm -hmm. they, they were getting traumatized by mm -hmm. it. And they said, okay, look, we've got to warn the people, but it doesn't have to be in a way that traumatizes them. It, it, let it be something calm mm -hmm. and they hear it they know they've got to immediately go to their 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 bomb shelters mm -hmm. and i was driving through uh Sderot, which is a city in uh southern israel under mm -hmm. constant attack from gaza even now during the so-called ceasefire mm -hmm. they're firing rockets on on our cities um i was driving through Sderot, and uh, i was telling this to this guy i was with about this seva adom and we had the windows down it was in, in the spring it was nice and cool and he said you mean like that and i you know i said haha very funny he said no i'm serious and I stopped talking because sometimes I can't hear other things when I'm talking. <laughs> and, Hello. <laughs> and I heard them saying, Seba Adom. And I immediately stopped the car, didn't even take the keys out, put it in park and ran into a bomb shelter, which was a, a bus stop, which are like reinforced mm -hmm. with uh, concrete. Um, and, you know, and, and the and there was full of people and, you know, and the air raid, you know, happened and, and um, the missiles fell and. Uh, and the point is that if you hear Tseva Edom, you run to the bomb shelter. Mm -hmm. It's an inevitable response. And so it's not the shofar here in the sense in this context. It is and it isn't, meaning meaning he wants you to know about, he wants you to think about the shofar that warns you to repent, mm -hmm. which is something throughout mm -hmm. the Tanakh. But he also is speaking in the sense of the shofar of there's a warning here. Mm -hmm. Of course you're going to tremble because that means the enemy's coming. Mm -hmm. And if there's evil in the city, is it not Yehovah who did it? Well, here's the thing. Before you get to that last phrase, I yeah. can't believe with the last phrase. When they're talking about these phrases, it's like, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree, right. I agree. Last right. phrase, eh. Right. Well, and all these <laughs> other things, they're, they're, they're statements that, you know, they're obviously not coincidence. Like exactly. common sense says they're exactly. not. Exactly. And so finally with the last one, right, this is the um, the tie-in. This is the culmination. Right. It's like, well, it's, it says, it's also Im ba'ir, if there will be evil in the city, by Yehovah lo hasa, and mm. Yehovah didn't do it. Mm. And I'm telling you, uh, that's that's the part that for me, when I was reading it, you kind of say, of course, you know, I, I, if it's if it's okay, I'm going to read this in the, uh, yeah, I'm going to read this in the NASB. It says, do two men, two men walk together? Let's, of course. Does a lion, of course. Does a lion, yes. Does a bird fall? Of course. If a trumpet is, of course. If a calamity occurs, and of course they use the word calamity. Calamity. Yeah, like because calamity it's a little James. bit, e yeah, it's a yeah. little bit, it's a little bit easier to swallow. Okay. The idea that if it's a calamity. <laughs> But uh, what does it say but, in the note? But I see this little note you got there. Actually, that what's, what's doesn't, that's not a, that's not acceptable as a note. You oh. can't. You know, this you, is a different deal here. You, you can't click you, on no, that. No, thing. no, no. Click on the note. But if you go to the the, the Hebrew again, I want you to Macintosh. say what it says. Yeah. Say what it says. Yeah, it says ra'a, mm -hmm. evil. Mm -hmm. It's the word for evil. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, there's another verse, Nehemiah, you could bring. Normally, you should have that right there. I yeah, like Isaiah, Isaiah 45, forty-five. You want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we and we talk and actually. Um, we talk about both of these things, this verse and the verse we're about to bring, meaning mm -hmm. the two walk together. We talk about that in our book, uh, Prayer to Our Father, mm -hmm. in the Hebrew origin of the Lord's Prayer. Um, and then this other verse, we also bring in that same uh, book, which is Isaiah 45. And here it's talking about, um, 
here, I'll start in verse 5. It says, I am Yehovah, there is none else. Besides me, there is no God. I engird you, though you have not known me. And here he's speaking to Cyrus. He's mm-hmm. saying, I, I put this armor on you, but you don't know me. You're a Zoroastrian. And Zoroastrians believe in two gods. He's saying, I'm the only one. And it says in verse 6, So they may know from east to west that there is none but me. Mm. I am Yehovah, and there is none else. Mm. I form light and create darkness. Mm. And then this is the JPS. I make wheel and create woe. But in Hebrew it says, I make peace and create evil. Mm-hmm. I, Yehovah, do all these things. Now, now to any of the translations, I don't remember. Yeah, here, King James. Here I give credit to King James. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Mm -hmm. I, the Lord, do all these things. King James Version. So they got it right. Well, I'll tell you what I like, actually, um, people that get confused about actually lean into it, as I like to say, and actually get excited about the fact that the God that I serve, the Almighty, the one and only, the creator of the universe, is is pretty darn amazing. I mean, there's, there's no competition you know, there's no there's no battle with him, and you know, like you know, some days he wins and some days he loses. Uh, the God that we serve is all powerful, and that's why when the prophet comes and here's this shepherd who gets this gets this vision, and he's bringing this information. Again, you got to read the whole book. Amos is an amazing is an amazing book, but uh, this just is another reminder of who God is. Right, I mean, he's amazing. So, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is really a heavy statement. Mm-hmm. And what's the point of the prophet? His point is, look, um, if evil happens, you have to stop and ask, why did this happen? Mm-hmm. If there's some like national disaster, mm-hmm. we've got to ask, why did this happen? Mm-hmm. And if all these other things are obvious, it should be obvious to you that Yehovah was involved in this. You know, and, and that was the point of saying before, look, for those who are close to me, I will be sanctified. And you know, mm-hmm. in this family, you know, if it, you know, I'm, I'm. There are going to be consequences for your actions. Mm-hmm. And then verse 7 is one of the most important verses of the Bible, one of my favorite verses of the Bible, my favorite mm-hmm. 500. It says, uh, Ki lo Adonai Yehovah deval. Yehovah, uh, um, Lord Yehovah will not do a matter. Ki im Unless he has revealed his counsel yes. to his servants, the prophets. That's it. And we've got to talk about the counsel. I know we're running out of time. Let's no, read this the, is very important. Okay, so this is a huge thing. So this is the word in Hebrew, sod. Maybe that should have been the word of the week. <laughs> we'll have two. Sod, samach vav dalet. In modern Hebrew and in later Hebrew, sod meant um, secret, mm-hmm. a secret. And well, there are people who will look at the Bible and say there are these secrets in the Bible. There's the plain meaning on the surface, but if you look deeper, you can find the secret meanings. Mm-hmm. But the, sod in the Tanakh doesn't mean secret. It means something completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the image that appears in Isaiah 6 in uh, 1 Kings 22, 19 to 21. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in many other passages, Daniel, let me read Daniel 7, 9 to 10. Uh, Daniel says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like lamb's wool. His throne was tongues of flame, its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire streamed forth before him, thousands upon thousands served him. Myriads upon myriads attended him. The court sat, and the books were opened. And this is the image that we see in many passages in the Bible speaking about the, what, what is referred to as the heavenly court. Uh, mm-hmm. The Bible doesn't call it that. Although I guess it did use that word in, in, uh, mm-hmm. in Daniel. Um, uh, 1 Kings 22, 19 to 2. I have to 20, tell you before you 21, read that, yeah. that tw- in, in, first King, uh, yeah. in Kings 22, that is, is by far, by far, yeah. definitely in the top three stories for me. Oh yeah, just the idea that you that's know, your he says in the Bible. You know, well, I can't say that. That's your stick. But uh, uh, when he when he says, you know, and he and he looks and he sees, and I and I saw this meeting taking place. Yeah, where God is there and the angels around, they're having a discussion yeah. up in heaven about what's happening on earth. And he brings the prophet in there and he lets the prophet see. And I mean, you talked about this again last week yeah. that the prophets get a chance to be in that place where they can see. This is what God is saying, yeah. and then how they know what to say. Yeah, so. and, and and I want to invite people because we are running out of time, and we, we want to try to finish soon. Um, so please go read one Kings 22 after you've read Amos, uh, two, six to three, eight, read King, throughout one King through the whole chapter, one Kings 22. Mm-hmm. It's a powerful chapter. It's amazing what it says there. And then, you know, share your comments, go to, Absolutely. uh, BFA international.com and my website, nehemiaswall.com. And also I want to remind people, share this on Facebook. We need people to stand with us, to share this on Facebook, to post it on Twitter, mm-hmm. to get the message out of these prophet pearls. Um, and you know what's interesting about that, Nehemiah, is that yeah. you, you've said this a lot uh, about the other the other ideas that are out there and the other issues that are out there and the conversations mm-hmm. that are out there. Yeah. We're talking about the Word of God, full hour yeah. on the Word of God, bringing language, history, and context. Let's share it with people and right. see if you can't. And, uh, and, and this, I will tell you, is 100% marketing what I'm doing right now. We are in the marketplace of ideas. Mm-hmm. And out there on Facebook, what you got is, um, you know, God is dead. Uh, the world is billions of years old. 
um, and all kinds of other nonsense out there floating, you know, and there's pictures of cats and puppies, which I happen to love. Which I but, think are absolutely... No, I don't understand. They don't, they don't They're adorable. Like Put your BB gun away. You can read pictures of this. <laughs> no. So this, so this is the marketplace of ideas and information that we're competing with, and we need to get this information in front Let's of people. This, this, this is Let's crucial. Share it out. The shofar is being blown, and the people aren't even hearing it. Mm-hmm. We've got to get this to them. So 1 Kings 22, 19 to 22. But Michaihu said, I call upon you to hear the word of Yehovah. I saw Yehovah seated upon his throne mm-hmm. with all the hosts of heaven standing in attendance to the right and to the left of him. Yehovah asked, who will entice Ahab so that he will march and fall at Ramot Gilad? Then one said thus and, and another said thus and, until a certain spirit came forward and stood before uh, Yehovah and said, I will entice him. How? Yehovah asked. Um, next verse, 22, he goes on. He's, uh, this is important. And he replied, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, you will entice and you will prevail. Go out and do it. Yeah. So Jehovah put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. For Jehovah has declared disaster upon you. And the point of this passage is that these 400 pro- false prophets, you can read it in 1 Kings 22, that they were prophesying through this false spirit. And Michael wasn't prophesying through his spirit. Mm. He was standing in the throne room and heard Jehovah mm. speaking with his own two ears, mm. speaking to the hosts of heaven. And, and Jeremiah makes reference to this when he challenges the false prophet. He really kind of taunts them. Mm-hmm. It's Jeremiah 23, uh, starting in verse 18. Now, I'll make this quick. Um, you know, this is, this is an uh, important passage. He says, but, who, uh, but he who has stood in the council of Jehovah, and the word there is sowed. Mm-hmm. Just as, uh, as Amos said, Jehovah reveals his sowed to his, his servants, the prophets. Mm-hmm. So here this sowed is, is, this, um, is this council. It says, who has stood in the sowed of Jehovah, the council, and seen and heard his word? He, must has, uh, he who has listened to his word must obey. Um, he goes on, and I'll skip ahead to verse uh, 22. If they have stood in my counsel, let them announce my words to my people and make them turn back for the evil ways and wicked acts. And he's speaking there to the false prophets because what the false prophets were doing is they're saying, I had a dream mm-hmm. and a word, you know, I received a word. And, and Jeremiah is saying, well, that's not what happened with me. I heard Jehovah speak in his counsel to the angels, to the hosts of heaven. I heard it with my own two ears. If you've done that, let's hear it from you. Mm-hmm. And they weren't able to do that. They weren't able to give that kind of information. And, and let's go back to Amos now. Um, and you know, it's really amazing what he's saying here. He's saying, look, if bad things happen, then it's because, um, Yehovah, this is part of Yehovah's plan. Mm -hmm. And he's revealed those things to his people, to his servants, the prophets. So these things aren't just a coincidence. It's not just two people happen to be walking on the same Mm -hmm. path in the middle of nowhere. They agreed to walk on that path together. They met one another first. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the bird happens to, you know, uh, you know, fall. No, there was a snare. And this isn't a coincidence either. This is Yehovah and his plan. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you all are going to do what Nehemiah asked is and to read the entire passage for yourself. The, the interesting thing is that the, the actual section ends with how uh, Amos begins. And it says here, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord in English Lord has Yehovah. spoken, who can but prophesy? And then, of course, if you go back to Amos chapter 1, it says... The Lord, Yehovah, roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. He is the one that's playing Mm -hmm. the role of the lion. He's the one that's roaring. Though I have to say, I mean, uh, sometimes you hear the, you hear the, uh, you turn on the television, you hear it roar and you hear the, the, the message of the day roar, but uh, it does not compare to when Yehovah himself roars. He's the, he's Mm -hmm. the ultimate lion that's going to roar. So. That is uh, the section. I don't know if you'd have yeah. anything well, else. Well, no, I, I just want to say real quick that this is, I actually wrote my master's thesis on this verse uh, and an ancient commentary on this verse. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that this ancient commentary Which asked, exact verse? Uh, this one, uh, um, verse uh, Amos 3, 7 was one of the key verses. Mm-hmm. And he asked the question, he said, there's all these things happening around me. This is a guy who's living in the ninth century. And he's saying, can these things just be random events or must there be reference to them in the prophets? And he was actually a Karite Jew named Daniel Akumisi, and he came up with a radical approach. He said, wait a minute, if there's all these things happening, it says that God doesn't do anything except he reveals his, his uh, counsel to his servants, the prophets. And if we have, you know, the rise of Islam and the fall of the Roman Empire and all these, you know, mm-hmm. world stage events, there must be something in the prophets about them. And so he came up with this this approach, which was really uh, unusual for Karite Jews, Um but not unique. And his approach was to say, the prophet may have spoken about something that applied in his time, but there's all these events that have to be explained and, and have to be referred to in, in the prophecies. 
And so he would say, well, there also could be um, this future application of that prophecy, mm -hmm. um, meaning there, there could be something mm -hmm. in the prophecy that applied in the time of Amos, but also we can look today and see how it's unfolded in our own times. Amen. So this is what we do, Proverbs, for, is exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit NehemiahsWall.com and BFAInternational.com.